Today's episode was brought to you by Skillshare. What is going on, everybody? My name is John Solo, and welcome to Disney Explained, the series where I break down various elements from your favorite Disney movies, like characters, events, and the storyline as a whole, so the next time you watch one, you get a little more out of it. As many of you know, I'm a huge fan of Hercules and have already made two videos about his adventures in mythology, one about his life here on Earth, and the other about the 12 labors he completed for King Eurystheus. But there's another character in Disney's epic I wanna talk about today, and that's Hades, the God of the Dead. In the Disney movie, he does everything within his power to kill the hero Hercules and take Zeus's place as King of the Gods. But as any fan of Greek mythology would know, Hades really wasn't a bad guy, at least no worse than the rest of the gods. And due to his portrayal in movies like Hercules, Clash of the Titans, the show Once Upon a Time, and even video games like God of War, he's perceived as a far more evil entity than he actually was. It's because of this that I want to break down Hades' true story as told in Greek and Roman mythology, the one in which he's rightfully feared, but far less malevolent. Before we dive into Hades' origins and his time on the Ebony Throne, I want to say thanks to our friends at Skillshare for once again sponsoring the show. As many members of our family know by now, Skillshare is an online learning platform that gives you access to over 25,000 classes in creative, business, technology, and lifestyle areas. I've been using them over the past few months to boost my editing and graphic design skills, but if you're trying to learn about cooking, data science, or even business analytics, they've got you covered at every level of expertise, from amateur to master. The amazing thing is a premium Skillshare membership is only $10 a month, but if that's still too much of a commitment and you want to give them a test run beforehand, the first 500 people who sign up through my link in the description get two entire months absolutely free. So check that out if you're interested. And now, fellas and females, it's time for us to dive into the messed up origins of Hades. If you haven't yet, make sure you smash that like button so we can reach our goal of 10,000 likes this week and subscribe to have more messed up content delivered to your sub box on a regular basis. So for you to get the most out of this episode, we should start with a brief overview of Disney's Hades. I'm sure you're all pretty familiar with him, but there will be several points of comparison as I explain his mythology, and as you'll see, they get pretty specific, so I want it to be fresh in your head. The King of the Underworld made his first appearance in Disney's 1997 hit Hercules, where he's shown to be unhappy with his godly responsibilities assigned to him by his brother Zeus, the King of the Gods. Well, they're just fine, you know, a little dark, a little gloomy, and as always, hey, full of dead people, what are you gonna do? Sick of living among the dead, he crafts an elaborate plan to usurp the throne, which involves kidnapping and killing Zeus's newborn son and releasing the titans he imprisoned eons ago. Throughout the movie, we see Hades' personality reflect that of a sleazy car salesman. He's manipulative, merciless, and has no problem causing as much pain and panic as necessary to get what he wants. Appropriately, he's also got two minions named Pain and Panic, as well as a three-headed dog Cerberus that guards the gates of the underworld. Most of the time, Hades is cool, calm, and collected, but the slightest inconvenience can set him off. What may be his only redeemable quality is that he's fair, meaning he never breaks a deal once it's made, even if he ends up on the losing end of it, which he often does. As a fan of the movie, I can appreciate the design of Hades' character, both in appearance and personality. He's actually one of my favorite movie villains ever, but as you're about to see, he's almost nothing like his mythological counterpart, except that maybe they both sound like James Woods. There's really no way of knowing. Many people are familiar with the Greek gods, but not many know the specifics of where they came from, and there's no way we can explain Hades' messed up origins without touching on his very messed up birth, because that's right, Hades had parents. Before the Olympian gods rose to power, there lived two generations of divine beings, the primordial deities and the Titans. Hades was the fourth child and first son of the Titans Kronos and Rhea, who were essentially the king and queen of the universe. Kronos took that title after overthrowing his father, the previous king Uranus, which he did by castrating him and throwing his balls in the ocean. After assuming power, Kronos learned from his mother Gaia, the earth deity, and his father, who he somehow remained on speaking terms with, that he would one day suffer for the same fate, and his children would overthrow him. Kronos loved his newfound power and his balls, so to prevent this prophecy from happening, he literally ate his first five children. Hestia, Demeter, Hera, Hades, and Poseidon. Yeah, I said Hera's name right this time. Can you believe it? 100 people who commented the same correction in the last video? I'm obviously not as smart as you guys, but I somehow pulled it off. Cue those same people commenting, nice try, you pronounced Demeter's name wrong too. When actually I listened to three different mythology scholars pronounce her name as Demeter, 
Demeter, and Demeter. I don't know, maybe there's more than one way to pronounce some of these names that no one was alive to hear pronounced in the first place. Just an idea. Anyway, after the fifth time it happened, Rhea was sick and tired of her husband eating her children. So when baby number six came along in the form of Zeus, she gave birth to him in a cave on the island of Crete, where he would go on to be raised in secret. Meanwhile, instead of a baby, she gave Kronos a rock wrapped in cloth, knowing that he'd just devour it immediately without close inspection. And that is exactly what happened. Years passed by, and all the while Zeus was being raised by the nymphs in Crete, his father had no idea. When the young god finally reached adulthood, he learned his true identity, as well as what happened to his brothers and sisters, and was determined to free them. Depending on the version, Zeus was given an emetic, medicine that makes you puke, by either his mother Rhea or the titan Oceanus, and he tricked Kronos into drinking it, causing him to throw up his children in the reverse order he ate them. It was at this point Zeus declared himself the master of the universe, but Kronos wasn't just going to step aside and let him have it. An epic war between the gods and titans broke out and lasted for 10 years without either side securing the W. That is, until Zeus traveled to the domain of Tartarus, where the monsters Kronos had imprisoned resided. Zeus released the hundred-armed Hecatonchores and Cyclops, who, as a token of appreciation, gave him thunder and lightning bolts to use as weapons. With their help, the Olympians Olympians were successful in overthrowing the Titans and banished everyone that opposed them to Tartarus. When it came time to divvy up Kronos' old territory, the three brothers drew straws. Zeus was given the air and sky, Poseidon the ocean, and Hades the underworld. The ancient earth deity Gaia could not be claimed because she was a strong, independent woman. So that is how the Olympian gods we know and fear started their reign. You may have noticed how similar it was to Hades' uprising in the movie, with the nod to Tartarus, the freeing of the Titans, the march on Mount Olympus, and specifically the the inclusion of the Cyclops. A pretty cool reference if I do say so myself, though I would like to see this 10-year Titan War fleshed out in the same glorious animation. So the big takeaway from that section when it comes to Hades is that Zeus is not the one who assigned him the underworld. He just got it by chance. And while some records indicate he wasn't happy with the result, there's nothing about him harboring long-term resentment over it. Which is interesting, because that's basically the foundation of his character in the movie. It leaves us with the question, what was Hades really like? Well, we actually don't know much. Because he was the god of the dead, not death itself, just to clarify, there is a difference. The Greeks mentioned him as little as they could to avoid avoid attracting his attention, meaning his personality was only as fleshed out as much as it needed to be. Another result was that he was given many different titles so they didn't have to say his name. Climenus, which means notorious, Polydegmon, which means who receives many, and Pluto slash Pluton, which means the rich one. The Greeks thought Hades to be rich because his domain was believed to be under the earth, the same place their precious minerals and crops came from. So they thought he played a part in doling them out. Oh, and Hades' domain, the underworld, was also called Hades something. Sometimes. Just thought I'd throw that out there. Like most gods, sacrifices were made to Hades to give thanks, and maybe more importantly, stay on his good side. They often sacrificed darker colored animals like black sheep, and participants would bang their hands on the ground before doing so to make sure he was paying attention. However, the person offering the sacrifice would have to avert his or her face to avoid being personally identified by the god of death. It's actually pretty similar to how UPS drops off packages. They ring the doorbell so you know it's there, but by the time you actually get to the door, the guys vanished without a trace, in and out like a demon's whisper. It really is a shame that Hades is so often portrayed as evil because he's actually said to have been altruistically inclined, meaning he really did care about the happiness of others. It's just that he was the kind of guy to do something philanthropic without posting it all over social media for clout, so few people knew about it. I don't want to get it twisted though, the god of death was still a menacing presence to be around, in case there was any confusion about that. He had dark features, sat on a giant throne of ebony, and the gates of his domain were guarded by his three-headed dog Cerberus, who would allow anyone to enter but prevent anyone from leaving. I couldn't find anything about how the real Hades obtained Cerberus, but in the Hercules animated series, it's revealed he got him as a present for his minions Pain and Panic, who kept saying they wanted a dog, then left him with the responsibility of taking care of it. Probably nothing more than a joke and shouldn't even be considered canon, but it's pretty funny regardless. Anyway, this intimidating demeanor Hades had may have been a choice on his part, but it was most necessary 
his line of work. After all, he was in charge of the souls of every person who ever died. Consider right now that there's more than 7.5 billion people on this planet and the disaster that would ensue if one person was in charge of keeping everyone in line. Yes, Hades was a god, and yes, he did have some help, but even way back then, way more people had died than are currently living right now. So needless to say, he had his work cut out for him and had to be on his A game at all times. I mean, no belief system on the planet would say a god sucked at what he was the god of, so Hades' character had to reflect that of someone who humans believed could keep billions of souls under control. This meant him being stern, objective, and holding everyone equally responsible for abiding by his laws and punishing those who broke them severely. In other words, he wasn't as much a tyrannical king as he was a stern judge, and I think this trait is reflected in the movie with the deals that he makes and never breaks, even when they don't go his way. While indifferent towards most of his subjects, there was a few rule breakers he had disdain for. There was Sisyphus, a king who found several ways to cheat death and was punished with the eternal task of rolling a massive boulder up a hill, only for it to roll back down when he got close to the top. Asclepius, a demigod who, throughout his lifetime, became a famous and talented physician and eventually learned to bring the dead back to life. Because Hades was feeling cheated out of those nice, juicy souls, he told Zeus to strike the demigod down with a lightning bolt. But after his death, Asclepius was brought to Mount Olympus, where he became the god of medicine, so he didn't really suffer any consequences. And then there was Pyrithus, who I talked about in my 12 Labors video while also pronouncing his name wrong. He tried kidnapping Hades' queen Persephone and was brutally punished by being bound to the chair of forgetfulness for the rest of eternity. As you can see, Hades had his hands full with his underworld responsibilities and making sure no one ever escaped was his primary concern. It's because of this that there's few stories about him ever leaving the underworld. He would even only go to Mount Olympus when he was called upon. On the rare occasion he did travel to Earth's surface, he would be wearing his helmet of invisibility to avoid being seen, which he got from the same Cyclops who gave Zeus his lightning bolts and Poseidon his trident back during the Titan War. However, there is one instance of Hades traveling to Earth I want to share, and it's considered by many to be the most important story he's involved in, the rape of Persephone. As I mentioned, Hades, the king of the dead, had a queen. Her name was Persephone, and she was the daughter of Zeus and Demeter, the goddess of agriculture. Hades fell in love with Persephone the first time he saw her, but he knew Demeter would never let her daughter go for a guy like him. So instead, he hit up Zeus and asked him if he could make her his wife, and Zeus said, fine, as long as you keep it low key. And yes, that's an exact quote. One day, when Persephone was picking flowers in the fields of Nyssa with the goddesses Artemis and Athena, Hades suddenly burst through a crack in the earth, grabbed her of her and dragged her back down to the underworld. In some versions, he was riding on his chariot, and in others, he wasn't. That detail isn't really important, but I mention it because his chariot was featured in the movie, too. Now, like most gods and goddesses, Demeter was very protective of her daughter, and right after Persephone disappeared, she began to wander the earth in search for her. Since she was the goddess of the harvest, Demeter forbade the earth from producing any food until Persephone returned, or in some versions, she's so distraught that she neglects her godly responsibilities. Either way, it wasn't long before before humans began to die from lack of food and cry out to the gods for help. Between the suffering on Earth and the other gods complaining to Zeus about the sudden lack of sacrifices coming their way, he was feeling the pressure and had no choice but to send Hermes down to Hades and ask him to return Persephone. While he wasn't happy about it, the rich one ultimately agreed to let his new bride go, but just before she boarded his chariot, he forced her to eat a pomegranate seed, then sent her off. When the girl was finally reunited with her mother, Demeter knew instantly something was wrong. As it turns out, because because Persephone tasted food in the underworld, she had to stay in the underworld. However, because Demeter really wasn't having any of that, they compromised that Persephone would get to live on Earth for two-thirds of the year. Some versions say two-thirds at least, some say three-fourths, and others even say half. It doesn't really matter. What's important is that every time Persephone reunited with her mother, the world's plants and crops would flourish, but whenever she went down to Hades' domain is when winter would fall on the Earth. In that solo fam is the messed up origins of the seasons, according to the Greeks, and the messed up origins of Hades. Thanks for watching. As always, this episode was really fun to make and the research process was trippier than ever. I've got like 10 new ideas for the Mythology Explained series now too, if not more. So I'm excited to be launching it in the next month. I'm curious to hear your biggest takeaways from this video though. Has your view of Hades changed after this? What do you think of his Disney portrayal after hearing his true story? Comment your thoughts down below and as usual, I'll be reading and responding to as many as I can. If you enjoyed this video, don't forget to hit that like button as we 
we've got a goal of 10,000 likes to reach. And of course, subscribe and ring that bell to have notifications sent to your phone whenever I upload. If you want to stay updated on Messed Up Origins news, get hints for upcoming videos, or just say what's up, find me on social media. My handles are right here and links are down below. Once again, I want to give Skillshare a shout out for sponsoring this episode too. Remember, the first 500 people who follow my link in the description will get a two-month premium membership for free and access to all the knowledge that comes with it. I'll be seeing you guys next week with another episode of Messed Up Origins. Until then, my name is John Solo, and remember, John shot first. Thank you.